Welcome back to Bulahdana, show the accent for those without one. People on Facebook, you've heard this few times today, they bear with us. But anyway, as I was saying, you know, it's been more than 25 years and uh, I have no idea what year we started, but it started in Arabic and we ended up in English and I don't know where we're going with this, but we're going to celebrate our 25th anniversary and we're going to put a show about the last 25 years, you know, reminiscing and nostalgia and um, bring some of those old shows. I know we started before YouTube, we started before digital, so some of the shows we don't even have, but, uh, but we try our best to bring a flavor and a theme of all the show, guest, music, culture, community, documentary. Uh, it will be very exciting. Anyway, uh, as we all know today, you know, we are uh, in the month of uh, uh, February, you know, this is a black, uh, black month. Uh, no idea what the story behind having a month for blacks. All I know, it is the shortest month of the year. And, you know, in black months, history months, we all will, I don't know how much history we know, you know. But uh, every black uh, history month, I kind of dig in and try to find out something I didn't know before. And this month, uh, there's a few things I didn't know before, which you know, I know in general, but it talks about how the blacks sold their and IG, they were treated in Germany during World War II, and I'm sure World War I too. Uh, but the segregation did not stop here uh, on our border. Also, there was segregation there with the whole platoon, the whole, uh, all the blacks together. Uh, and segregated from a white uh, soldier and officer, and also segregated from uh, the, uh, the society there at large, so they cannot be showing uh, with, uh, you know, uh, uh, the German uh, prisoner of war, you know, make sure there would not be a off black officer or an IG officer, black officer, overseeing uh, or supervising, a, a, you know, a German white uh, a prisoner of war. It's very interesting that all this, about 10 million blacks went to the, that war uh, throughout, uh, 100,000 uh, went to this, uh, and they, at some point they were in Germany uh, fighting for freedom and fighting for uh, the defeat, uh, uh, you know, Nazism and defeat fascism and defeat uh, white supremacy, but uh, back home is still suffering the same. Even some of them, they say, we don't get homesick. And uh, you know, some of them, they wouldn't even go on uh, you know, their breaks back to coming back to visit their family. So this is just a sad uh, state of history that we are living here. Anyway, uh, election, uh, democratic debates, uh, history, I mean, uh, all I know, you know, throughout my four years in this country, that Republican Party always bring in or nominate idiots, average, second-rated uh, actor, uh, racist, uh, alleged rapist, uh, clawless, uh, ignorant. We are accustomed to that. But now the Democratic Party is producing his own. We have now uh, Bloomberg, you know, a white, rich, uh, racist coming and to mess with this uh, uh, you know, uh, Democratic Party now and the nomination and how you defeat uh, Trump and the issue of uh, people now that the bosses of the Democratic Party are kind of working hard uh, not to let uh, the nomination, nomination goes to Sanders. Everybody accuses him all sorts of stuff, socialism and all of this. So we have, it's going to be a deba debate within the Democratic Party between socialism and capitalism and the vision we want to see the United States, the, this country, the future of this country, and also we have uh, at the end uh, Trump. And so let's talk about a little bit about why the socialism is getting the bad rap in this country. Is really Sanders uh, a socialist? And he, you know, what he's uh, breaching is socialism, and how the socialism develops through all the years, and uh, the damage that capitalism done through all these years. Uh, it really not been talked about very uh, enough, and we all talk about the damage of socialism, communism, and all that. The, uh, how did this all evolve? We have our guest today, uh, Jim Kelkoff. He's an economist. He, you, know, you know, welcome to Balahdan, uh, Jim. Thank you. Uh, you know, 
the, the history, I mean, uh, you know, socialism, you can see uh, as it evolved from capitalism and uh, what happened in Europe, and you can see some people, you know, social, social democrats there in half of Europe, probably social democrats, so people accustomed to that are not scared, they're not terrified. But here in America, you, you hear socialism and everybody seeks shelter, you know, and uh, a little bit. Well, in, 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 in the simplest terms, capitalism is dominated by private ownership of the means of production. That's what an economist would define capitalism, yeah. private ownership of the means of production. It doesn't mean that all means of production are private ownership, but it means it's kind of the dominant understanding of the way society should be run and what you should kind of achieve, you know, try to achieve is, is, is private ownership of the means of production. The reason it's done that way, and the reason the, the reason we'd argue to do it is because, because uh, with private ownership you have m multiple um, uh, market actors that compete with each other to to obtain more efficiency and less waste, and therefore more wealth for everybody in society. But if mm -hmm. you do it, that's the argument. Of that. mm -hmm. Socialism, the strictest form of socialism, would be what what people often call communism, uh, coming from Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto, is is really. Uh, uh, community or c communal in the strictest sense, but really comes down to the state ownership of the means of production. And, um, and so, so to put it in kind of the context today of where people are arguing about, even, even though uh, Bernie Sanders um, says that he's a, a, a democratic socialist, he, nothing in his he's uh, not work, he's not advocating for, for the government ownership of the, of the yeah. means of production. He's, he's really advocating for what people have called socialism since the 19th century starting in Europe, which is that socialism is a way to correct for the problems of capitalism just so that people don't rebel and, 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 and overthrow it. That's what that is. So, so socialism is, is, is a kind of a capitalist thing going on underneath that, that, that in, in, in conservatives in, in the U.S. it's called conservatives and liberals, that you would say liberals advocate for socialism, really what they're advocating for are, is a safety net for people that are hurt by, 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 by the well, raw yeah, form of actually, capitalism. Actually, uh, that's an <clears throat> interesting part because when you, when you look at uh, Obama mm -hmm. as uh, say progressive, I know the first black, I'm not sure about that, is a, is a closet white as far as I'm concerned. But anyway, but he, he, those guys, uh, they call them liberal or left in the Democratic Party, they are coming to, to save capitalism. Yeah, that's the whole point, and, and, and they're very open about it. In, in this election, that's exactly what Elizabeth Warren is advocating. Her, her policy positions are very similar to Bernie Sanders, but mm -hmm. she's very clear to say that I am a capitalist because, the, because she's very clear that this is, she's not trying to advocate for socialism in the form of you know, what happened in Eastern Europe or, or some of the far left uh, political movements in Europe happened. She's advocating for, for, uh, for capitalism and just wants to correct for the, for, the aid, for, for the capitalism so that the people with the pitchforks don't throw everybody out in the end. That's what people are worried about. But you know, mm -hmm. capitalism has been the dominant force now for how many years? I mean, for about 250 th years. Th but th really, really a dominant force for 200 years. Capitalism sure. is very, very new. Mm -hmm. People sometimes get this idea that there's always been capitalism and we're just kind of in the mm -hmm. late stage of it. No, capitalism is, was a revolutionary, brand new way of organized society. That happened about 200 years ago, about around, around the late in the in the, uh, in the uh, late 18th century, uh, starting in England, really. So uh, take us before capitalism. Yeah. What, what was the society look like? The engine of the economy at that time, uh, be, be, you know, from eight, before 1800, and, and you know, at 1800, 95% uh, of all economic production occurred without any exchange of money or gold or any trinkets or anything. It was all just done in the household. People had independent, self-sufficient rural households, dominating 95% worldwide, whether in Europe and China, everywhere. 95% of any goods or services produced uh, in exchange with other people or consumed was all done in your household. And it's very uh, similar like to part that. Partnering? What, what, bartering and people barter with this. People would people yeah you could you bartering but but bartering is a very simple way of just saying what you do in your normal household. If you're in your house now, you ask you 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 ask your child to do the dishes for you well, and, and they do. I mean that's basically uh, what. What it I is. mean the household was self-sufficient. The household was self-sufficient and there was an extended family household and they mostly you could you could you made your chairs you made your furniture. Uh, I see. Ninety-five percent of the things you made. Interesting. Five percent of the in, at the same time not, not coincidentally. 95% uh, of the population lived in rural areas and only 5% of all people lived in either towns, small towns or larger up to big cities. Only 5% of the world population. 
recently now in the last 20 years, it's become 50-50. Now 50% 50 of the world population now lives in an urban area, a small town or larger, whereas 50% uh, mm -hmm. still live in, in rural areas. In the United States, it's about 25%, 24, 25% live in rural areas, and uh, the rest live in, in towns of 5,000 people or larger. Uh, you, you were, were talk, we talked before, uh, I um, mean, uh, you know, agriculture, you know, farmers in this country were not just feeding America, they were feeding the whole world. Yeah. And you, say, you said uh, uh, our agriculture is only half a percent of our uh, economy. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, the, whole, the, the, the economic value, if you look at the GDP, of the economic value of the U.S. GDP, it's like one quarter of one percent is, uh, is in terms of agriculture. If you're, going to, if you're looking at the agricultural tables of the, of the GDP, of the, of the GDP tables, you know, zero one agriculture, zero two manufacturing, you go or mining, and zero three go, goes on like that. Zero one agriculture, it's it's a very tiny percentage of, so of everything that we that everything that's made and produced in in, in the economy today. So we could <clears throat> do without the agriculture, without really noticing noticing anything. Well, in terms of what in, in terms of what the economic uh, numbers would look yeah. like, you could get rid of all of agriculture. And you wouldn't see even a blip on on the GDP uh, numbers of what would happen. That's, so how that's do we eat? Well, that's the problem is, is that is that you'd still starve without the food. It just turns <laughs> but you're out happy that with the it just spreads. Yeah, it's, 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 I mean, really, what would happen is you would import those goods from another country. And so, so, mm. and, and, and the reason it's of issue is a lot of people talk about uh, climate change. That's a that's a big issue today. Uh, agriculture, just because it uses up so much land. Is is in a, is responsible for a very large portion of of uh, greenhouse gas emissions and other uh, other sorts of pollution in the, in the water from, from f uh, fertilizers and uh, pesticides that get in the water. It, it, it accounts for a very large percent of all the, uh, of all pollution. But so conceivably, it just theoretically looking at it, you could you could really just tax tax agriculture to get rid of their practices and just really make it expensive. And uh, the rest of the economy really wouldn't notice it, Ex you know, except when the farmers disappear and the farmers go away. And that's why that's that's why that's why just looking and at just looking in a strict dollar sense, yeah, it, doesn't, yeah. it doesn't make sense anymore. And that's where you see the and limits a lot of looking of, at that. Uh, millions of farmers went away, and we didn't even know. I mean, well, since, yeah, the, since Reagan, I don't know how. Well, many. Since, even before Reagan, yeah. the the the, yeah. the, the, uh, the decline in farmers, and that's that's simply because farms are. Uh, uh, farms are, are uh, of increasing returns to scale just about yeah. everywhere. Farmer, the larger a farm gets, the, uh, the, the more you can spread out your fixed costs and therefore just making it one acre larger, adding one more cow, adding one yeah, more yeah, pig, yeah. you increase the profitability of doing that one thing, just mm -hmm. making it ever larger. And that's, in, in, well, and that's, what, that, that's, that's kind of what, uh, that's what, that's what causes the, the push to, to make ever larger there. And that's because farms per acre of land do not make any more money today than they did a hundred years ago. It's the same. If you go back and, and, and you adjust the dollars today, yeah. if you go back a hundred years, uh, farms made about a hundred dollars an acre in land in 1900. Go up to go up to today and adjust for uh, you know in, yeah. in, in, in the, I'm going on two thousand ten dollars when I when I first looked at this. It was mm -hmm. adjusting day. Bounce you know bounces around a little bit. Come up to today again. It's right back there. It's still a hundred dollars an acre. Is what a farm like now a little bit less. This was, I mean, the history of the United States is very much linked to the history of capitalism. This, yeah, is, yeah. this, this, this country started at the yeah. dawn of capitalism. This mm. is the history you can trace the history of the United States. You can see everything about capitalism just looking at this one country. Mm. We started when capitalism started. That's that's mm. where that's really what when when uh, when but, it is. And so you, but when when we look at the, the vices of capitalism, you know. Cap you know, and uh, capitalism also dying by uh, free market democracy, right? Yeah. And then when you look at that, they produce, uh, uh, you know, major crises. And, and I'm talking about depression and all that. But also they produce Nazism, fascism, uh, inequality, uh, racism, slavery. Uh, so horrible, uh, horrible things. And we'll talk about... Well, let's take a, a, no, another look, and we, maybe we'll change a little bit and bring some social ideas and collective ideas. Why American panic? Panic. Even the, you know, people in the Democratic Party, they look at Sanders, which, as we said, is not even a socialist. He's, gonna, he's dangerous, he's risky, he's going to destroy or whatever. I think one of the reasons people panic is, uh, is, is, is one, there's a, large, there's a large number of people who just think that, well, 
you know, I might be a millionaire someday, so I don't want to face these high tax rates. I just want to get light. It's, it's like the lottery, the lottery thing. I don't want to take away my freedom to participate in the lottery, even though on average I lose. That's that's that's. But that's but that's probably a small part of it. I think a, a closer part of it is is the fact that that it's hard to find anywhere where where socialism hasn't really uh, hasn't really become. Uh, dominated by some sort of authoritarian top-down mandates from a from a government that mm -hmm. uh, that, that uh, from you know, from a state apparatus it's hard to find examples where that that hasn't really happened and that's what people that's what people do fear in in and I'm speaking especially from in, in Latin America there was a lot of hope among among uh, left-wing intellectuals everywhere in the world because in Latin America in the early 2000s, starting, with, starting in the late 1998 with the election of Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, yeah, yeah. but then with his help and then uh, with, with a group called the Grupo del Rio in Rio de Janeiro that had met, and, and they were all very left-wing communist socialist parties all throughout Latin America, right-wing dominated Latin America at that point. This was the, the high point of, of, of uh, what you'd call, you know, what, what came to be called neoliberal uh, Thinking yeah, yeah. was in the, all the, the Chicago government. school. Yeah, that. it was all throughout Latin America. Within a few years, with popular elections, democracy was everywhere in Latin America. They elected, I think, in some 22 of their governments, all of South America and and most of uh, Central America and the Caribbean, became uh, uh, they elected socialist governments running on a platform of socialism. They called it 21st century socialism. They called it, uh, and and that was the, that was, the, and, it, and it was actually promoting. They said we are on a process to have state ownership of the means of production. We mm -hmm. think that's a good thing. That was, that was what they talked about. Mm -hmm. Very popularly elected by people, one in large majorities throughout the throughout the, the. We're talking about 500 million people. Probably of those, about 350 million became or more became uh, became popularly elected socialist governments, just straight out. And uh, largely nationalist socialist government. So they say, so not in the terms of Nazi nationalism, but they very much looked at the, with the word sovereignty in the name of their parties yeah. and things mm -hmm. like that. It was very much focused around a type of nationalism I, as anti American. And their economy was not part of the capitalist economy, globalization? It was, was it part competing? of the that, It was part of the noble economy. Throughout yeah, this whole period, throughout the year, 80% of their trade remained with the United States. I mean, the United States continued to dominate yeah. the Latin America during this time. And and um, and the United States didn't, didn't really try to do much about it. It was, uh, I mean, there was there was uh, there's a lot of uh, an alleged coup against Chavez in Venezuela at the time, but other than that, it was kind of a low period for the United States activity in trying mm. to get involved in things. During People, Obama, or something. Yeah, it was Obama, but even during Bush, it wasn't really a focus of what was going on in America. Also, it was all democratic, so it wasn't it wasn't an yeah. issue. Uh, Russia wasn't trying to 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 get in to get in on there. Mm. Um, uh, Cuba was very much weakened, and so and so it was. It was an area where they're saying, and it was all Democrat. People were popularly elected, and they still trade with us. And they not. still traded with us. Was a problem during this period. Yeah. Venezuela, Venezuela, which was very anti-American. Hugo Chavez would come yeah. out in the United Nations, just lambast yeah, George Bush. And they, they still sent all of their oil to us. Yeah. Yeah, they, all of their oil would come yeah. to us, and that was. Well, the same so, was so, a, so Iraq they, and exactly. Libya. There's, there's no reason to dominate a country politically if you can still get everything you wanted out. Yeah, so, exactly. so you just buy it. Well, <laughs> and that's and so what that was, the Bush said. <laughs> we'll, we'll have to go and get it instead of giving it to us. Why can't you trade? Why can't you? You, you, you could have just bought go it. Go pay for it. <laughs> could have just bought it. Yeah, yeah, could but just buy it. But yeah, that's. But so, what makes capitalism is so dominant and so effective? Well, yeah. I think uh, what in the last, you know, whatever, I mean, uh, I mean, hundred years, let's say. Well, part of that, I mean, part of part of what makes capitalism so effective, in, in the reason it gets adopted very quickly by societies that get exposed to it, is because it gives so many people power. It, it, it and power is very important to us. Just real not, power or perception of power. It's real power because because if you think about what power is, power is just getting other people to follow you to do things. <laughs> I mean, that's what it is. The basic concept. It's getting. It's it's what you call I communicative. Uh, Hannah Arendt. Daughter, Hannah Arendt kind of defined this as a communicative uh, mm -hmm. definition of power. And what it is is that is that you get people to you get people to stop doing something else to do something as a group. And if you're the leader of that group, you've got power. 
and so because because you have but followers. That that's, group that's doing something for their own benefit or for just a few? That's what we will find. That depends on the group and what their aims are, what the goals of the group are, and what and what the leader can convince people to do. Well, but, when you look for one percent on eighty percent of the wealth, we know what group we're talking well, about. Well, right now, right yeah. now you can say in, the, in in capitalism right now, but from capitalism from nineteen forty five up yeah. until nineteen eighty, it was I a lot see. different. It I was see. a lot different because the rules that, that that have been put in place were a lot different. It was so there is nothing more. wrong with capitalism except when become excessive or abusive. It's not that there's anything wrong with it. It's just to understand that capitalism is a is is a, uh, a social mode of of, uh, of of people relating with each other that happens to be extremely effective at material goods for people. Lifespan has increased greatly under capitalism. Uh, wealth has increased, and the human population has has uh, multiplied several times over. There was a billion and a half, two billion people at most in the early yeah. 1800s. Now there's seven billion people, and the reason is because people can live in cities in much much smaller areas and do things just by learning how to how to yeah, uh, yeah. interact with each other. And in they markets. have the and same productivity. Yeah, it's they have technology. But they can also still. Be survive. They can also give a survive. Only only a quarter of a percent of of, of oh, really only in the United States only two hundred thousand people produce almost all the food <laughs> in the country. There's one point two million farmers. Most of them yeah, are yeah. hobby farmers. Yeah. Two hundred thousand real farmers that produce almost all the food in the country, and that's enough for everybody. Everyone else can do other things. You don't have to produce the food, and the people you can eat. And the people produce the food can manage their tractors with a, with an iPod now and and, and it's a, <laughs> and, and drones and things. Well, so you get it. <laughs> so and so it's a it's a fun job now. And so, but you get. The bank owning all of this, and you become uh, working for the banks instead of working as self-sufficient as a farmer. That's what well, it used to be. Yeah, it is, and, that, and that's been and that's been the way banking has worked. Um, you yeah, know, not just LA, yeah, yeah. I mean, in bank in banking itself is very new. It only go, dates to about the Renaissance with with uh, uh, with Italy. It does. It's but a how about thing. the the effect on uh, the culture itself? I mean, uh, measuring the the success or effectiveness of a, of a system or a, or uh, society by just material production mm -hmm. uh, is not that uh, uh, anti-intuitive of being as human, you know. If you can measure that by our value, culture, and all of that. So, what's the cost of all of this? If you just restrict it to any, only the things we can measure, that's with the thing we can value. Yeah, and that's that. That's um, that's a, that's a difficult. And the, and the, the just the, the farming example is just a very simple example on, on the limits of that. Just because it's only one quarter of the economy in terms of what it is, if you got rid of all the food, nobody could eat. All of a yeah. sudden, that's drastically a lot more valuable well, do than day-to-day -day market rates are showing what they are. And so, and so, You're not gonna and so your say, same with individual happiness. There's a lot of things that aren't reflected in the market. And economists, you know, they they they. You know, conceptually, you try to call those externalities, things that are true and exist, but aren't reflected in the market price for yeah, goods and yeah, services. Exactly. And that's called that's called, and, it, and it's a it's a big how to deal with those externalities is a is a, a big and a very controversial. It's not study. Uh, uh, would you study that in economics? Uh, that's economics? pretty much all economics uh, yeah. economists study. If you go to get a doctorate in economics or a master's, you, they, you pretty much all you're going to be working about is problems with externalities because oh, they're, really? because they're they're non. They're, yeah. they're not simple problems yeah. to solve. Complicated. So, yeah, they're so with, with all this put together in a nutshell, you've seen the debate of the Democrats and, and uh, who has the best, most effective argument so far. Now, I know Bloomberg has spent $400 million to get his ass kicked. Yeah. So that's <laughs> not going to work. Well, it, it might work actually because it's. I mean, and it, it might be a. It might be a, a, a good bet. Bloomberg and his and the theory behind the Bloomberg is that a massive amount of resources can get the votes necessary to win, and you know, is this democracy? In, in most cases, it, well, I don't know. It's uh, it probably is because it's just saying. You know how do you, how normally do you get people to vote? You go out to try to convince people to do things. It might be a it I might, it might be not it's, from it him. might be not an ideal form of democracy to basically allow people to spend money, uh, yeah. you know, without limit to Only buy the your rich vote. is going to win, which right? Was yeah, and, and at, one, at some point you have to ask why not just allow a legal quid pro quo and pay yeah. people, you know, buy people's vote and see how much yeah. you did because it's essentially the same thing. But yeah. but but at, but at the to do that in Egypt, right? But at the end of the day, what we're talking about is a contest for power yeah. for people. People trying to figure out how to get how to how to get a, a society to get the con, a sufficient consensus in the society to do things to arrange the, your life the way you want to, and there's two very uh, diametrically opposed points of view. 
mm-hmm. on, on the uh, Republican side right now, which, is, which has been taken over by a nationalist party, and a populist yeah. nationalist party, which yeah. is very similar to the fascism of, mm-hmm. of Adolf Hitler and, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and the Mussolini and, and Tojo in Japan and, yeah. and, and, and the, in the uh, in, uh, Italy. Yeah, in, in, in Italy and yeah, the fa- the fa- these fascists are very similar. And, and you know, in fact, if you were to go back, you know, you, in, you know, I don't suggest anybody do this, but if you if you go read Mein Kampf, much of Mein Kampf is is talking about how great the United States is. He, he, he goes through and he talks, he spends whole chapters talking about how great the United States is because of its, because of its uh, racially, uh, his, his, his racial because, immigration policy. Yeah. That's what it is. We should do the same thing in Germany. That's what he was advocating with that, with that book. But and, you know, so it, I know we have to go here. Uh, how did this guy, this uh, guy, a, a TV, reality TV idiot accused by being racist, uh, being racist and all of this, to have that much power and to try to achieve that many things in, in, in a few years. Well, I think, the, how is it different than a Harvard graduate articulate, the guy who saved capitalism, Obama, saved the Wall Street and didn't care much about the people. You know, was Wall Street saved was his priority. It didn't accomplish as much in, in, in eight years. Yeah. Well, I think there's two, uh, for two things from, from what I can see the, 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 that he's done. He's been able to connect with people that felt like the rest of society didn't like him, that thought they were deplorable This is popularity, people. but actually an executive, an executive branch. Yeah. He was able to make those executive decisions. Why didn't... Why weren't they able to do it? Yeah. Well, what he did is he looked at he looked at the he lo- he read the Constitution differently, and this is the same thing Trump he's done. Trump read the Constitution. He he read the Constitution differently, and, oh. and 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 this I think we have to give him credit for this. He he's done the same thing throughout his career. My uh, I I um, when I was doing my doc, my, my I was in a doctoral program at the New School in New York. My advisor lived in a, one of the first Trump towers that was built, and he explained to me how when they built that Trump Tower. It was built with uh, with tax credit financing, which means that 20 percent of the units have to be set aside for low and moderate income yeah, people, yeah. and and that was the rule. It was one of the first buildings in the U.S. that did that. And so he he had gone through and he read the rules. And so what he is, he built the building uh, right there in the Upper West Side, of Manhattan. Nice building, very wealthy people all moved into it, or just you know it, yeah. people and making up, yeah world. people people making six figure incomes above can can buy an apartment there and move into it. And then and then he for the 20 percent. He bought kind of a low, low, rundown place in the middle of the Bronx, way far away from that building. Can he you did do that. that? It doesn't have to you be know in the what? same building. He read through the rules and allowed him to do it, and he did it. That's what I he see. did, and that's exactly what he's done now in, uh, in, in as the president. He's run through Article Two of the Constitution, and it says, you know what? It says <laughs> nobody else can see this, but it says that really I can do anything I want to as, as long as there's 34 senators who will, <laughs> who will vote to acquit in, me. In your company, and whatever you I'm gonna, invest. And I'm going to try to run things on that. And he's been pushing that way. And you know what? So far he's been right. And that's, uh, and that's a problem. And Article 2, you talked about it. He's using it now. Yeah, he's been repeating this constantly. He says Article 2 says I can do whatever I want. Everybody says, no, he can't. He's lying. He's lying. Well, you know what? February 5th, well, he, just, he just proved us all wrong. <laughs> well, the Democrats don't read Article 2? Well, they just a Republican thing. I think the Democrats and even the Republicans, you read Article 2 and you say, oh, no, that would be horrible. I'm yeah, not going to do it. I'm not going to do that thing. And, and I think Trump has been doing this. He's been pushing the envelope on what is, well, what, Blum- what is acceptable behavior and what is, and what, and what is legally What you can get away with. Well, yeah, Bloomberg did something similar when he was a mayor. And he, he came across to the white wealthy that the, the, the problem in New York is the blacks. And we need to move them away from the area. Uh, where the white, uh, rich white are, and that's yeah. what keeps the value down because the blacks are there, and he managed to chase the blacks out of this. And how, the, the thing is, this guy is running for the Democratic Party. He is, and he, I mean, yeah, he, and he had been a Democrat before he was mayor. Then he became an independent so that he could run uh, with a Republican with, with Giuliani's support. And then well, he was, was mayor Democrat? There. I thought it was yeah, No, he, but he had been a Democrat, then he became an independent, and then he, or then he became Probably. a Republican uh, with Giuliani, then he became an independent. Uh, whatever finally, works and then for him. Whatever works. And so, so in that way, he's looking, you know, party identity is not that important, and I can, I can uh, kind of push the end of the... He's not, I mean, if, if you're going to ask him, he's not going to say, I didn't do these against the blacks. I was yeah. doing these things against areas with higher crime yeah. in these areas. Yeah, you know, it I'm, just so happens I'm that... I'm saving the city from crime. Right. And it, well, Jim, thank you so much. Been enlightening. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much. As far as I'm concerned, Sanders or nothing. See you next week. Salam alaikum and God bless you all.